I am so delighted to be back with the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. I am joined today by several members of the committee. Mick, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, good, Jason. Thanks for having us back. We've also got Richard Gage. Richard, how Hi. are you? Doing great. And Christina, forgive me. Uh, Borgeson. I should have Christina accused Christina Borgeson. Well, lovely to have you. Welcome back to the show, Christina. And I want to thank the Lawyers Committee, not only for the excellent work that you've been doing for basically two decades, but Richard, you've recently had a bit of controversy with the architects and engineers for 9-11. I'm very curious to hear what happened. I saw a bit about it in Variety and in Slate. Can you tell us exactly what is going on with this uh, Spike Lee documentary that was initially intended to feature you and a lot of the information that you've developed over the past 20 years. Yes, uh, Spike was impressed with some of the videos that um, that we did create. I, I was the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth and the CEO for 15 years until September uh, when uh, uh, some series of events happened. Uh, one, I had uh, a series of comments that I made uh, about COVID because I'm quite concerned and alarmed about that issue and the response to it from our government, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. Um, I, uh, but uh, so, so while that was going on, I was interviewed by Spike Lee who wanted, who said, I got to get you in here. I saw 9-11 9-11 explosive evidence, experts speak out. I was blown away. I said, sure, I'll come. So he brought me a year ago to Brooklyn uh, and we he interviewed me for two hours. I gave him all the evidence, Jason, uh, World Trade Center evidence, explosive demolition evidence uh, that uh, the lawyers committee has uh, submitted to a, a, for a special grand jury investigation. And uh, he was going to add this segment, uh, which he had made uh, at least a half hour segment, uh, onto his HBO special, which did air on September 11th, but without the half hour that was uh, composed of uh, our experts, myself and, and family members, because he had put it in his face uh, by Slate Magazine these comments that I'd made. Now, uh, Spike had kind of bought into the official narrative of COVID. He wanted to get all the black people uh, in in New York vaccinated because they're an underrepresented underrepresented group. And um, so he felt undermined, I'm sure, by these comments, <clears throat> which um, made me look in his eyes like a conspiracy theorist rather than a technical representative of 3,500 architects and engineers that I had signed on to my petition at AE 911 Truth. Well, the board was convinced by our PR consultant that this was a PR crisis and that the CEO had to step down. So there was a, a big battle and, um, wow. and uh, I lost and so I'm out. And so I'm on my own now. Uh, so that's the short story. I'm, uh, I started Richard Gage 911org and we have uh, many uh, uh, podcasts like uh, the ones you're showing there, the webinars where we present the evidence uh, every uh, week and uh, interviews and so forth. Uh, it is uh, pretty exciting uh, what I'm doing. It's a whole new set of skills that I'm learning, a whole new set of uh, offerings to the 9-11 truth movement to advance the, the movement forward. Uh, we're going to be hitting it hard. And then something really special happened. Uh, I was adopted. <laughs> I was orphaned <laughs> by AE 9-11 truth, but then uh, invited to come aboard uh, the lawyers committee for 9-11 inquiry. And they saw they, they thought that I was uh, um, more of an asset than a liability, which uh, the previous board at 1811 Truth had uh, thought the reverse. So uh, I was honored to uh, accept the position of being on the board of directors at a lawyer's committee for 9-11 inquiry, that's for sure. Hmm. Well, 
thank you so much for sharing that story, Richard. And I'm sorry that happened. It must have been quite a blow on many levels, emotionally and otherwise. You've dedicated at this point so much of your life to the efforts of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. You've become really one of the most vocal figureheads in the world of 9-11 Truth. And that's disappointing that Spike Lee would do that. Uh, you know, it's funny. The reason I selected this image of him is because he's so concerned about COVID. He's not even properly utilizing the mask. He is questioning science. And that is theater. So we got to be careful what we say here on YouTube. It's become an environment that's very hostile towards the First Amendment. But I want to talk more about what's happening in the world of 9-11 Truth and specifically what the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth uh, Inquiry is going to be doing moving forward. I know the last time we had you and members of the Lawyers Committee on the show here, there was a mandamus suit. It seems to be this ongoing effort to try to get the government to do what we, the people, expect it is intended to do, but does not do. It's pretty close, Jason. <laughs> um, so that lawsuit, it's, it's not never ending, but it is longstanding. Uh, the New York lawsuit started with our petition to the grand jury and to the U.S. attorney in New York, uh, federal grand jury. The U.S. attorney refused to tell us whether he had or would deliver the petition to the grand jury. So we sued the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York Federal Court. The District Court decided that we were basically right about the duty of the U.S. Attorney to give the grand jury the evidence of the crime we reported, which was the demolition evidence for the Trade Center. That's what we were putting in the petition. But uh, the District Court decided we did not have standing to enforce that mandatory duty. And so we appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, which is where the case stands at the moment. Uh, our argument is coming up uh, January 21st. We'll put out more about that later when we know more whether it's going to be virtual or in person and the details about how folks can you know, watch or listen. Uh, and then we expect to get a decision a few months after that. Uh, we do expect, you know, I mean, we're cautiously optimistic. You can't guarantee what a court will do, but we do expect to win that on, on some level. Excellent. And what is this case here, Mick? The, uh, is, I presume Barr is William Barr. He, when we started, he was the attorney general. Right. So he was named. Uh, we have a new attorney general now, Merrick Garland. Long story, he was involved in another suit that we brought in D.C. regarding the FBI 9-11 Review Commission, which had ignored the, dem the demolition evidence. And we sued to compel the FBI to look at that evidence because Congress had mandated that they do that. To make a long story short, that suit went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided not to hear it, unfortunately for right. us. But uh, before we got to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for D.C. was reviewing our appeal. We got dismissed on standing in that case, too. Long story. But my family members, at a minimum, don't have standing in these cases. Still mystifies me. But... Um, during the D.C. Circuit Appeal, our judges, we had a three-judge panel, our judges were disclosed, their names, and one of them was Mary Garland. Huh. And so we had, we had Mary Garland on our three-judge panel before he became Attorney General. While he was being considered to be appointed as Attorney General, while we were suing the DOJ, <laughs> the agency would come to lead. And so when we discovered this, we asked for a disclosure from the Court of Appeals and Judge Garland, we did not get any. The court refused to give us a disclosure. And so we ended up losing that case on standing grounds without any real understanding of what Judge Garland's uh, detailed involvement was. We do know he was involved with the panel when they decided to remove our oral argument. We had oral arguments scheduled in that case, and then it was taken off the calendar. And uh, Judge Garland was one of the three judges who voted to take off the oral argument. Uh, long story, but that's sort of, uh, we have another interesting case, if you wish to talk about it, on a Freedom of Information Act on the FEMA uh, building study on the demolition. Uh, at your convenience, I'll tell you about that one. Sure. Why don't we have Christina weigh in, and then we'll continue with that story. Well, I, I think we should let Mick continue, and then when we get oh, to the film sure. part of it, uh, because I'm, I'm the investigative uh, director for the Lawyers Committee, so, um, and, and I'm a relative newcomer, but um, 
Mick is our in-house uh, legal genius. He really is. And he's the tribe's memory for everything going on in the legal department, which is what, what we're all about. You know, I mean, the, this is what makes the lawyers committee basically unique in the world is we're the only organization that's actually taking uh, the crimes, you know, we're, we're putting them into petitions and briefs and we're taking them to the courtroom. We're the only ones doing that. So yeah, go ahead, Mick. Yeah, well, I mean, in I'll fact, you guys are doing, if I might interject, Mick, you guys are yeah, doing yeah. the work that we would actually want the Department of Justice to do, and instead, they're <laughs> still you, on you. That's right. That's right. Thank, That's thank exactly you very much. Right. We're trying to do the government's job without the government's resources, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, but Christina has sort of given you a hint as to where our most exciting new project is going, which Richard and Christina can tell you about. It was sort of Richard's brainstorm. We then elaborated on it to the Lawyers Committee and Christina is going to produce it for us because she is a, uh, a an accomplished director and producer for documentary films. So we have a new documentary film coming up, but I'm not going to tell you about that yet. I'm going to tell you about the last lawsuit, and then we'll let Christina and Richard tell you about the new exciting documentary, which happens to be called, just coincidentally, uh, except I'll, I probably won't state it with precision, 9-11 uh, Crimes, is it? Crime scene to courtroom. It's crime scene to courtroom. That part I got. So uh, you'll hear about that shortly. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to work with Christine and Richard on that. Short version, uh, Jason, on the third lawsuit. We sued uh, FEMA and NIST for records uh, regarding the building performance study, uh, which FEMA did, looking at the collapses of the Trade Center buildings. Uh, I represented David Cole, who was our FOIA guy at that, at that time in that lawsuit who had put in the request. Initially, FEMA told David they had no records and, and responded to his request. Now, keep in mind, his request was, I just want to see the records of your data that you used in preparing this detailed study, which you have published. And their answer was, we have no responsive records. So you have to let that sink in for a minute. How can an agency that did a detailed study and published it have no records of the data they used in that study? So that, Are we looking at oh, the study right now, Mick? Uh, see what I can't. That might be it. Does it say FEMA building performance study? Yes. Yeah, so okay, I mean, these are records responsive to the request. <laughs> well, yeah, well, the study itself is record responsive. So how could they say they have nothing? So that caused me to be concerned enough to get involved. And so we did sue. And eventually FEMA explained, well, we used to have the records. But we gave them all to NIST another federal agency, the National Institute of, Sta Institute of Standards and Technology, so NIST could use them in their study, and we didn't keep anything, not even a backup, not a hard drive, not a thumb drive, not a backup email. We gave NIST everything, but of course they didn't give NIST everything. That wasn't believable either. So after we sued them, shortly thereafter, we got a bunch of the records that they said they didn't have. Uh, they produced them. And but they they withheld the key records that we really wanted, the most interesting and incriminating ones. And so we continued to sue and we filed respond, uh, respective motions for summary judgment us against the government. The interesting part about this case, which may surprise some people, is that the uh, the trial judge assigned it to a magistrate judge who examined both sides motions and issued a tentative ruling that the the trial judge is now considering to either approve or not, that tentative ruling was in our favor and it recommended denying the government's motion for summary judgment, which alone leaves the government in a position of either losing or going to trial, neither of which they're going to enjoy. And the other um, decision was that our motion for discovery should be granted. Which means- now, If I could stop you for just a second, yeah. Mick, because we're getting into a lot of technical legal stuff that some of our- yes lay audience may not understand. The motion for summary judgment that the government is requesting would essentially shut down your case without a trial. They're asking the judge to rule on the pleadings without allowing you discovery, which would be your ability to compel them to produce evidence and documents that will allow you to prove your case. And what you've just described is they're basically lying, saying they don't have the evidence, and then they present you with some of the evidence Help us understand how 
this isn't perjury. I, I've become a little bit more oh, wow. experienced with law in the past four years than I might I want to be. That. And it's shocking to me that people just brazenly hide facts and evidence like this with no repercussions whatsoever. Well, sometimes there are repercussions, uh, but you just gave a pretty good description of the law there, Jason. So if you haven't gone to law school, you might want to give that some thought. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're right. The And why it's not perjury, th that hasn't really been decided yet. We haven't literally accused them of perjury. We have accused them of withholding records and misrepresenting uh, why they withheld them and what records were being withheld. That's pretty close. We haven't used the P word in the case yet. We'll see if it goes there. Um, but they don't have a very good, at this point, a very good record to stand on. They, at one point they told us, okay, we understand that you're telling us these other records must exist because some of them we actually referenced in our own report, even though we're telling you now they don't exist. They understood the problem that they were in in regard to that. So they said, we think they might be in a warehouse, um, an archive warehouse. We're, we'll send, we're willing to send someone over to search that warehouse for those records. So we said, okay, go ahead. Let us know what you find. And then they came back and said, oh, sorry, we were wrong. The warehouse does not exist. And we explained that to the judge and the judge said, well, you know, that one's going to be a little hard to walk back. So, <laughs> you know, they're, they're in a difficult position. Uh, and that's another case we expect to win for the reasons we're describing exactly how it's going to go. I can't tell you with precision. It's up to the judge. It could be decided any day. But that's sort of where we're at on the litigation front. We have some other freedom of information things going. I won't give you those details at the moment. But you may want to ask Richard and Christina what's happening with this new documentary thing. Before we move off of the legal issues, I'm anticipating a potential problem. Okay. Isn't it correct that officers of government agencies are immune from lawsuits when they're acting in their capacity as government officers? And wouldn't that create kind of a catch-22 as far as if someone's lying to you? Although, I guess negligence and malfeasance are doesn't work, huh? There are exceptions, Jason, which you will learn when you finally go to law school. <laughs> and the uh, the short version is basically lying, committing perjury, committing crimes, doing things that are not in your job description will take you outside of the protection of the immunity that you have because it won't be in the course of your duties that you would have done those particular acts, even if your superior approved you doing them because it wouldn't be in the course of their duties either. So there are exceptions to immunity. Uh, there are some immunity issues. Uh, now, we're not trying to put anybody in jail in this suit, so that type of immunity doesn't come into play. Uh, what we're trying to do is get an injunction, force the government to give us the records, and their immunity really won't help them for that type of lawsuit. Interesting. Excellent. Well, I'm definitely interested to hear more about this upcoming documentary. Well, well, let Richard. me say this. <laughs> With the, the AE 9-11 Truth produced a great film by four families uh, who, who were featured in it. And Dylan Avery directed this film. It came out on uh, in September. And uh, it is a great insight into the 20-year struggle of these families to obtain justice. What they didn't have time or space to do was to present the actual evidence to back up their claims that the World Trade Center towers were blown up. So that's where this new idea comes into play. And so for many years, actually, I've been wanting to update the evidence and, and uh, which we put forth in the documentary 9-11 explosive evidence experts speak out and so uh having been a in, in invited onto the lawyers committee for 9-11 inquiry and b where there is a sitting uh board member christina borgeson who directed a twa flight 800 oh my god uh, we have to talk about that <laughs> you know about that one. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of people don't know. So it it this is a, if you'll forgive the term, Christina, a marriage made in heaven. Uh, the combination of AE 9-11 Truth's uh, primary uh, researcher, speaker, 
uh, with uh, Lawyers Committee for 9-11, who's already assembled 60 exhibits of this powerful uh, testimony, uh, uh, oral testimony, and, and uh, eyewitness testimony, and forensic evidence. Uh, now with the director, uh, Christina, uh, we're just marching forward with this film. And I can't tell you uh, how powerful it's going to be because we're going to be looking right into the eyes of the grand jurors because this will be submitted. Mick can tell you about how that works to them. And, we're, and we'll be putting the public in the position of a grand juror to decide for themselves whether this evidence uh, merits a, a, a real investigation and whether uh, criminal um, indictments may be forthcoming and, and who might be a witness, those hmm. kinds of issues. Uh, so uh, I'm ready to deliver this evidence uh, in, in these bite-sized chunks, if you will, 10 to 20 minutes based on the components of evidence. And Christina has some incredible ideas about how to package this so that it'll be very, very well received and professional. Wow, that sounds very interesting. And, you know, TWA Flight 800 it's come up a lot lately on Crowdsource the Truth. I grew up on Long Island, and I remember when the plane exploded in 1996, right in the middle of the summer, a pretty tepid day. It was interesting that uh, an acting, or sorry, an assistant U.S. attorney at the time, uh, as Jack Cashel alleges, violated the law by handing the investigation over to the FBI, taking it from the NTSB. This is another one of these mysterious investigations where, just as Mick has described to us, the government is obstructing your progress, seems remarkably similar. Christina, what can you tell us about any potential connections between TWA well, Flight 800? That's that's actually how I came to know the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, because um, I did this film um, with a, a physicist, Tom Stalkup, who had been reviewing a lot of the forensic evidence. And we got together and we managed to get half a dozen um, major whistleblowers to come forward, people who were um, high level members of the original official investigation to come forward and talk about how they were on how their efforts were undermined and um what happened eventually and including for example uh henry hughes who was um a senior investigator uh for the national transportation safety board at the time and his job was to uh put the plane back together he was in charge of that and it put and uh Anyway, uh, you know, they laid it all out. And what the other thing that we did was we brought these experts in together to talk to each other because this investigation was highly compartmentalized. People were not allowed to talk to each other. And so when they came together and did a technical review, each person of their with their component, their piece of the pie, all of a sudden they realized, oh, my God, yeah, explosives were involved here. And um, so we put this whole thing together, basically presenting all the evidence. Um, and it was the people who actually handled that evidence and had the expertise to assess it. These whistleblowers, they came forward and the film came out and it was uh, <laughs> It was quite a shocker to the uh, the to the official source community. I'll tell you that, and they had a hard time dealing with it. But um, after that, I wrote um, with Hank. I was helping him write uh, his affidavit that um, he wanted to submit to the Office of Special Counsel for review on how the investigation was undermined, and that affidavit is literally like a parallel narrative to the affidavit that the 9-11, the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry submitted about the World Trade Center, um, the ordinance involved in the World Trade Center, the demise of the World Trade Center. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? How is it a parallel? 
Well, th because there were earmarks of high level explosives in both cases. OK, um, in the case of uh, in the case of World Trade Center, um, you had the molten steel, uh, you had the eyewitnesses, you had the the huge sounds, you had the seismic recordings, you had all that, you know, you, I mean, Richard can tell you, give you a, the, a longer list than, than I can, and so can Mick, but, and in the case of, um, in the case of TWA Flight 800, um, right when the power went off in the plane, the radar records debris flying out of the side of the plane at a speed of Mach 4 or more. <laughs> so an exploding fuel tank does wow. not, you know, does not uh, cause Mach 4, you know, debris to travel at Mach 4. You had, you had situation, you had, of course, the eyewitnesses who saw many eyewitnesses who saw something go up and then they saw the explosion. And then Hank Hughes was saying he couldn't figure out when, when, if the fuel tank itself had exploded, it would have been a very localized explosion. But what what Hank said was that the explosion was definitely very high pressure and it was random. The, the, the damage was random throughout the plane, which meant it was a, a big explosion, very high pressure. And when he saw when when he saw the, the radar tracking and he saw that that debris coming out at Mach 4 he said yes that you know that makes sense so the pieces sort of fell into place uh I mean we we, we obviously we had other we had a medical forensic guy we even had a forensic guy who was talking about he had he came up with a new term he called it interbody implosion because he had one victim come in who had and who had was DNA swabbed, and then a separate victim came in, same DNA. And so, how can two people have the same DNA? And it turns out they just happened to be testing the DNA on two pieces. These these, these people, their their flesh had been fused together. Ugh. Okay, that Horrible. doesn't happen from a fuel tank explosion. But so anyway, so we did that film, and when and. Again, when I read the uh, the petition for the World Trade Center, I, I did the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was like, oh, my God, this is exactly the same thing. And they used the same tactics to cover it up. I mean, what they did yeah. was the FBI came in because they said, oh, this might be a terrorist event. And the FBI takes over under all circumstances if it's a terrorist, a criminal event, not terrorist, criminal event. But the yeah. thing is. The thing is, is that the National Transportation Safety Board, by law, is still allowed and should uh, continue its investigation without hindrance from the FBI, which, of course, did not happen because the FBI and the CIA, by the way, came in. They <laughs> even did the was, simulation animation yeah. that was provided by the CIA, which is yes. very bizarre. Yeah, that simulation, what they did, the way they... Uh, the way they did that was um, they they recorded the um, they took the eyewitness accounts from people who had heard the sound and then looked up because and you realize why that's that's good for them to do because if you hear the sound and then look up you've already you've missed, missed the initiate the right. initiating event it was the people who saw the initiate they saw this thing go up exploded they hear the sound because sound has to travel so that's how they made that that bogus tape and we we broke that down and and you know debunked it but anyway <laughs> it's the same struggle but and, and i so wished i mean tom stalka uh, the physicist is trying to bring this um, this travesty that happened with TWA to the courtroom, but you know he doesn't have this. I mean, the commit the lawyers' committee for 9/11 inquiry is is actually a powerful tool because there's a lot of expertise there and a lot of knowledge about the evidence and the uh, you know and and how to move it into the courtroom. Absolutely, and I would even offer that one of the biggest uh, weapons that the government has against 
the victims' families or anyone that is looking for truth in any of these events is just the sheer cost and complexity of mounting any kind of legal action. And the fact that the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry is a 501c3 nonprofit organization means that people who are concerned about these things can make tax-exempt contributions on the website. And uh, that goes a long way toward helping us get truth in some of these matters. I personally, I, I'm so glad to have met you today, Christina, because I personally have been really becoming convinced that there is more connecting the TWA 800 incident with 9-11 than most people realize. There was a, a whole tie-in with Ramsey Youssef, who was the no. original World Trade Center. Well, this was the false story from the FBI, right? right. That they tried well, to say. The, the terror, they always try and sell the terrorists. They, that, that's the first spaghetti they throw up against the wall. Oh, it's a terrorist. <laughs> that's right. In that, in that sense, it is, it, you know, it, it is, uh, there, there is a connection in that sense. And it yes, all went down in the Southern yeah. District of New York. Yeah. Uh, Robert yeah. Mueller was yeah. involved in both yeah. incidents, even though Robert Mueller wasn't the director of the FBI at the time. I'm sure you must be com uh, familiar with James Sanders. And, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, you know, I I was a producer at CBS. I was a documentary film producer at CBS when this happened. And um, uh, Jim Sanders arranged for Terrell Stacey, a, a guy who was part of the investigation, the official investigation. He arranged to get a piece of seat foam that had some stuff yes. on it. He arranged to have that sent to me at CBS. But Jim Sanders was being surveilled by the FBI. And uh, so when he FedExed that piece for me, because I was going to do a 60 Minutes piece, it was, uh, it was tentatively called uh, Trouble Inside uh, the TWA Investigation. And I had asked um, the senior producer, Josh, I said, hey, you know, this guy wants to send me a piece of evidence to test. You know, should I accept it? And he goes, and I said, there's a grand jury looking into uh, leaking stuff, leaking out of the investigation. He goes, no, no, no. You know, we've we've dealt with grand juries before. Go ahead. So, all right, I went ahead. The, he FedEx is a thing to me. The FBI comes after me at six wow. at, at at CBS, and you know, now they say, and and so without a peep, without a peep. I mean, I had to give the uh, the piece of evidence to my boss, and without a Seat peep, phone. she gave it right back. Yep, gave it right back to um, the NTSB, and uh, that was the end of my career. Wow! <laughs> they pro they just, protected just me so from the from the grand jury, but uh, from being dragged in front of the grand jury. But but um, they uh, that was it. I mean, I want people uh, they to did appreciate not renew my this, contract. Christina. You went from being an Emmy Award winning producer at CBS to getting <laughs> fired for just approaching yeah. this story. Now, that's supposed to be news that you're reporting over there at CBS. And for people who maybe aren't familiar with some of the details that we're talking about, James Sanders, I believe still is, married to a woman who was a TWA employee, Elizabeth Sanders. Yeah, Liz Sanders. Yep. Yep. And, and yep. through her. Uh, professional connections with people that she worked with, one of the TWA 747 experts had provided her with foam from one of the seats that contained Captain residue Stacey. from a missile. Yeah. Right. Now, now he was part of the investigation. So, and you know, the law says if you're part of a federal investigation, if you're, you know, an interested party is what they called it. And uh, he had the right legally to have it tested anywhere he, anywhere he wanted to have it tested. Oh. But the FBI told the C CBS, oh yes, that um, that it was sent here, it, it was sent to me illegally and that it had to be, it had to be returned. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, there were all kinds of shenanigans going on. It's, it's quite shocking. I mean, if you read um, Henry Hughes's affidavit, you'd be shocked. And, and you would see the parallels between that and, and the petition that, that uh, was written by the Lawyers Committee on the World Trade Center. 
So, I, I mean, they, they have a playbook. It's a cover. There's a cover up playbook and you can <laughs> it's it's not hard to follow after you've been through a few of these uh, investigations. It's it's pretty clear, you know, how they do it. But the problem is, as as Mick, as Mick is, uh, you know, has detailed, you know, in in this in this uh, interview that we're having, they they lie, they hide information, and they do it. Unfortunately, I feel with no consequences. I I Mick has heard me jump up and down a lot about this. How I feel we should go after the individuals who, who lie who lie and, and withhold the information because that's not their job to do that. That's, that is that, not their that's job. Right. And, and it's, of... it should be a crime. We pay let, them. Let me, to... Pardon me, Christina. Let me interject for a moment. And while I'm interrupting you, let me give you a time check because I know you had a time issue. Oh my God. All yeah. right. Okay. So, but Jason, uh, you may want to talk to Richard more about the early episodes of the documentary, but Christine is getting into now what may come in the later episodes of the documentary because it's going to have two components. It's going to lay out the evidence and, as Richard would say, make the evidence come alive for the what we hope will be grand jurors, and if not, certainly for the public in the place of the grand jurors. Yeah. And But in, after we lay out all the evidence with Richard's help, we're going to get into the cover-up, the government yes. cover-up. And that and just will before also we, in, in the just before we release Christine, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. Mick, but I, you're right. We've got her late for her meeting. I just want to drop one little piece of information to detail that she might not be aware of, and that the audience might not be aware of. James Sanders and his wife were actually threatened with criminal action, and the U.S. attorney uh, who handed this investigation over to the FBI was later appointed general counsel of the FBI, not by James Colstrom, who recently died, but by uh, our buddy Robert Mueller. That is now federal judge Valerie Caproni, Caproni, who's presiding over two cases that I'm involved in. Quite interesting. Oh, yeah. There's a game. Yes. When when there's so, some cleanup to be done, there's there's a game there. So Absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry I have to bow out, but, you know, Richard, Richard will give you all the fabulous details. And it was a pleasure being on your show. Lovely to meet you, Christina. We definitely want to have you back and talk about this some more. Thank you so much. OK, take care. Bye bye now. So, Mick, Richard, please share with us the details of this upcoming project. Uh, Richard, I'll let you go. OK, let's um, let's talk about it, because, uh, I mean, this is the film that the 20th anniversary of 9-11 was made for. I mean, uh, it's, it's, this is the first film that's going to package the evidence in precisely a way that a gr not only a grand jury, but the public can understand it legally. Mick will talk about, you know, what, what that means. What is evidence? What is, what is this evidence? Um, how should the grand jury be looking at this? Um, for instance, they're, they're gonna see uh, building seven coming down. You know, no plane hit this building. This is the third skyscraper to come down on 9-11. It was hit, uh, it, it was not hit by a plane. So, but nevertheless at 520 in the afternoon, it drops like a rock straight down uniformly, symmetrically into its own footprint in under six, well, seven, under seven seconds. Now that's free fall acceleration. So we're gonna have experts explain to the jury what that really means. That, that it falls as fast as a bowling ball falling from the sky. There you see it there. Well, wait a minute. It had 40,000 tons of structural steel framing in it. it and not, that means not one of those 80 columns gave any resistance. Where did they go? So they're gonna have the opportunity to understand this graphically uh, with, with expert witnesses. And the, the, uh, they're gonna also see the evidence of what happened to those columns 
in the form of molten iron flowing down the channel rails, as the firefighters say, like lava from a volcano. Well, guess what? Office fires, which is the official cause of this building's collapse, have never produced uh, molten steel or iron. And yet there's abundant, overwhelming, irrefutable evidence for the melting of steel, the molten iron found in all the World Trade Center dust by the US Geological Survey in the form of molten iron microspheres. The, 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 the jury, the grand jurors are gonna see this. They're gonna have an opportunity to understand that they can't have come from any other reasonable source other than a, a, a thermitic event and it, with incendiaries in the case of building seven, uh, extremely hot uh, uh, iron exceeding 2,800 degrees, the melting point of steel or iron. So they're gonna put that together along with <clears throat> over at the Twin Towers, a laterally ejected structural steel sections weighing four and eight tons, ejected uh, 600 feet in every direction at 80 miles an hour. And they'll hear from the physicists how that doesn't happen in a gravitational collapse. Uh, and, and, and so this is a very explosive event with enough energy to hurl each of these, uh, like it could hurl a, a 200 pound cannonball three miles. This is a lot of energy and there's thousands of these. They're gonna hear from the first responders themselves uh, from the oral histories, 156 first responders on tape talking about explosions, uh, seeing explosions, hearing explosions, seeing flashes of light, many of them, throughout the building at various points, but all before the collapse of this building. Well, explosions are not a part of the official story except for in the lobby where they say there were some explosions due to uh, jet fuel, which is ludicrous on the face of it. But they're gonna see the seismic evidence also where there were explosions detected near the time of the building's collapse, actually before, uh, several seconds before the beginning of the collapse is what the seismic data shows. And actually several seconds before the planes hit the towers as well. So this is a, a, a just amazing evidence, uh, all available at Columbia University from their seismic uh, observatory uh, in Palisades, New York. Uh, I'm, I'm just getting warmed up to tell you here what it is that they're going to see. Uh, but What's of greater import than this, because I've provided this evidence over the last uh, 15 years, um, now it's going to be packaged uh, by the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, and uh, Mick can tell you more about how that works. Mick, so, away. Well, the short version is we do want to make this evidence come alive and be understandable, not just for a grand jury, which we hoped we'll be seeing it. And the way that would work, Jason, is we would submit the the documentary episodes as supplements to our grand jury petition, as formal supplements, file them with the U.S. attorney intended to be given to the grand jury as our primary petition. The same obligation, legal obligation, on the U.S. attorney will, will exist to hand that evidence, which is a supplement to our petition, to the grand jury. And you know, we're working through the Second Circuit appeal, hoping to get to the point where the there's going to be a court order saying, give all of this to the grand jury. So we're hoping, literally, to have the grand jury watch the documentary as a user-friendly exp explanation of the evidence. We've, we've also offered to come in uh, and, and collaborate, essentially, with the U.S. attorney and present this evidence in person to the grand jury. The, the U.S. attorney has not taken us up on that offer at the moment, uh, but we hope that he will, or she will, as the case may be when the time comes. So that's, uh, we want to make it user friendly. And I used to teach mathematics before I became a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 30 years, but I taught math for 10 years. And uh, between Richard's skill at essentially making this science popular, which he's done a great job of over the last 20 years, 
making it user friendly for the audience. I want to bring my uh, training as an educator. I got my master's in education and, a, and the equivalent of a specialist degree didn't actually get it issued working on a doctorate when I got distracted with becoming a lawyer. And um, I hope to use those skills uh, with Richard and with our team at the Lawyers Committee to make this a very user friendly presentation of technical evidence. I mean, technical evidence can be a challenge for a layperson and for a judge, uh, to be frank, uh, and for some lawyers as well. And so we want to put our, our, our mutual skills uh, together to make this really understandable in a user-friendly way. And one of the concepts here you just showed, actually, with the, the video of the Building 7 collapsing, which is, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and a video may be worth a hundred thousand words. And uh, there aren't many ways, in fact, I think there's only one to explain how that Building 7 collapsed in the way that you just saw it. And so we want to help folks see the visual evidence. But then there's the more technical, like the, the sulfidation of the steel and the high temperatures observed and the molten spheres. And how do you get those things? How do those things come to exist? And if you look at the science, uh, there's only one way, only one way they can come to exist, extreme temperatures. Temperatures more extreme than jet fuel can create, more extreme than building fires can create. And it's one of those, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains must be the truth, Sherlock Holmes thinks. And, you know, between Richard and I and our crew, we're going to make it clear to folks that some of this evidence has only one explanation. And so our petition actually does eliminate the impossible, leaving what remains to be controlled demolition. And, um, and then you've got the evidence related to the cover-up. And one of the big principles we'll be talking about is another Sherlock Holmes thing, the dog in the nighttime. I don't know if you remember, Jason. The, the dog that doesn't bark. The dog that doesn't bark, but should have barked unless, yes. unless the, the perpetrator guy. was known yeah. <laughs> in the dog. Okay. And so, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Watson dutifully asked, you know, is there anything, Sherlock, you want to draw my attention to? Sherlock says, well, the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And Watson says, well, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Sherlock says, that was the curious incident. And why? For the reason we just said. And, and so what has this got to do with the World Trade Center and the evidence and the government cover-up? Well, Richard has been putting out this evidence, including, and not just Richard, but Kevin Ryan, Stephen Jones, go down the list, uh, David Ray Griffin, for 20-some years. And what has NIST done to investigate it? What has the FBI done to investigate it? Why haven't they attempted to duplicate the finding of, of nanothermite in the World Trade Center dust that Kevin Ryan and his colleagues published? And why haven't they looked at the extreme temperatures that Richard has so eloquently articulated that has only one explanation? So what we're talking about here is it's not a literal dog, but it is a watchdog. You know, the FBI is supposed to be a watchdog. And this of sorts is one. They are given the duty by Congress to look into these collapses of buildings. So why aren't those dogs barking? Okay, and you have to think about it. They're not barking because, well, maybe they know the perpetrators. And so that's part of the ongoing investigation. You know, we're trying to connect those dots and, and you're gonna get more about that in, in the documentary. I think the other thing that dogs generally don't do, Mick, is to bite the hand that feeds them. <laughs> so I think that might play into it as well. And I know that lawyers aren't very comfortable answering questions of opinion, but you and the other lawyers on the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, along with Richard and his colleagues and all the people that you guys speak to in trying to unravel this mystery, you've really been exposed to more of this data and educating people into what went on, probably more than any other people on earth. What would you say, Mick, why are so many people, even when they're shown this irrefutable evidence, why are they so resistant to the truth? Yeah, Richard may have a thought on that too, but let me give you mine. And Ed Asner actually asked me this before he passed away. You may know we lost Ed as one of our board members recently. Ed was very outspoken about this issue. And, and one of the issues he raised with us is what you just noted, which and he said, you know, when I speak to people, 
I find it still challenging. This is Ed Asner, a very elo eloquent speaker himself, an eloquent actor, saying, I have trouble articulating this to people in a way that they can get it because they're, they are resistant. They're resistant to it. And, I, and the short answer to that is, in large part, there's been a, a orchestrated propaganda campaign for 20 years to convince people to not look at the evidence, to not think for themselves, to accept what a government talking head tells them. Here's Ed, and we miss you, Ed. But um, it's it's a challenge, um, and people need to realize that you're being propagandized on major issues. It's not just 9-11. Look at global warming. We had a propaganda campaign that was modestly effective for a long time that has unfortunately put us at risk of catastrophic damage now from climate change because the industries responsible for it tried to you know, convince people by using millions of their dollars that it wasn't real. And now we know it's real. And now we're gonna suffer the consequences of their propaganda campaign. Look at the tobacco industry and the propaganda campaign they did for years to convince people smoking wasn't harmful. Well, 9-11 isn't any different. It's another one of those propaganda campaigns and it's caused people to be resistant and what Richard and I and our colleagues are trying to get folks to realize is this is one of those things you need to think for yourselves on. You need to look at the evidence yourself. You need to decide it for yourself. And that's what I did. And that's why I'm here. You know, this isn't helping my career to speak of, to be with the 9-11 Lawyers Committee, but um, I'm here because the evidence convinced me. I'm not a has big Has it harmed your legal guy. career, Mick? Has it harmed well, your I career? Well, I don't know that it has. It's hard to know. You know, I'm, I'm still getting whistleblower cases, but of course, whistleblowers understand this problem. But because right. uh, I'm now a whistleblower, Richard is a whistleblower, Christina is a whistleblower, you know, and Jason, you might be one too. But uh, so, uh, you know, what I did was when I tripped over the evidence, I tripped over it by walking into a meeting in an environmental group I was representing to try to save the forest. And somebody had just watched David Ray Griffin. And I think, uh, probably Berkeley, and they said, you know, something about bombs placed in the buildings. And they said, what are you talking about? And then I got sucked in because they said, well, the buildings fell down at the Trade Center because, not because of the planes, because of explosives. David Ray Griffin has blown the cover off of it. And and I said, you know, I probably mentioned a few expletives at that point, because I knew what that was probably going to mean for me as someone who follows the evidence. And I started to follow the evidence. And you know, here we are 20 years later, or however, 15 years later, however long it was. You know, Kevin Ryan, who happened to be living in Bloomington, Indiana, where I live, uh, educated me on the science, and you know, here we are. Well, Jason, um, uh, Christina is particularly interested in cutting through the resistance of the grand jurors, because they're people too. And she specializes in bringing a story uh, because stories work better than evidence. And in this case, she wants to wrap this story, uh, uh, this evidence with, with a, set, a couple of personal stories. In this case about uh, Mick, who is a whistleblower attorney and who specializes in, in uh, uh, helping people who are fighting big government and, and, and big corporations. Um, uh, and, but he, he's, he's a person. He, there's, there's things that drive him, uh, uh, desires for justice, uh, for instance. And, and myself, um, I, I was just particularly angry that we've been lied to on a colossal scale, a global scale kind of like the, the current uh, disease going around. We, we just continually get lied to. And, and so this just boils my blood. And, and so my prime motivator is, is, is to take action, to, to wake people up, uh, re help them realize they've been fooled. But it is harder to do that uh, than to fool them in the first place. Absolutely. And, and when we've been fooled, we're up against uh, something inside of ourselves um, that we're in, we're invested in our worldview, and the truth about 9/11 uh, begins to shake that worldview, and so a lot of people won't, therefore, even look at the evidence, uh, even when you 
ask them, uh, although half, people, half the people will, uh, when you ask them, did you know a third tower fell on 9-11? And, and, and half of them will go, well, no. What, what do you mean, a third tower? I would know if the third tower fell, but they didn't. And I didn't even either. And most architects and engineers didn't and don't. Um, so uh, I was uh, quite, quite shocked to learn that. And it began to shake my worldview as I realized, well, okay, that was a controlled demolition. It looks just like the old hotels in Las Vegas. Right. And the Twin Towers, when they came down, they look uh, like uh, a, a, a very explosive demolition as opposed to building seven which is a very implosive demolition well by the time you look at all the evidence you're faced with a question that you wish you hadn't started uh the march uh and that is uh okay if these are controlled demolitions who's responsible right how did they right. get away with it why is the media censoring it uh why 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 aren't the the the, the architectural and engineering industries all over it uh, after all, uh, architects are responsible for the fireproofing for buildings, and the fireproofing is what is uh, being uh, uh, unimplicitly cited as the cause of the collapse, particularly of Building 7, but also the Twin Towers. So we, the architects are just saying, oh, no, that's an engineering problem. We'll let the engineers handle it. The engineers are controlled by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which um, was responsible in the original um, cover-up uh, with the FEMA reports, uh, well, wow. originally before the FEMA reports. And, and so uh, anyway, we don't want to stop and realize that our government was who's responsible for our safety. I mean, we pay them to do that. We put them in place to do that our forefathers did, uh, and, and all of a sudden we realize that they've been taken over. Uh, it's a cancer in our own government uh, by uh, domestic and foreign corporations who have much to gain from 9-11, uh, which we can get into another time. Yeah, uh, well, I'd scary. like to, if I may, Richard, I'd like to point out a very thoughtful uh, and creative treatment that I believe was created by you or perhaps the Lawyers Committee You've got three beams of light where there would normally be only two. I presume someone has uh, Photoshop digitally added the third beam to represent Building 7. Is that correct? In, the, in this case, this picture is an actual third beam, uh, wow. which was uh, four searchlights. This is an idea of Barbara Honiger, and she and I put this project together, uh, I guess, about 10 years ago. Uh, and those four searchlights were on a pickup truck uh, strategically placed for this photograph to be taken. <laughs> so wow. it looks just like the other beams. It represents yes, it does. building seven, of course, the third beam. Yes. Yes. Very thoughtful. And, you know, I would like to ask you, Richard, because, again, you have been around the country and around the world, really, lecturing about 9-11, interfacing with so many experts in so many different fields, whether it's architects, engineers, firefighters, filmmakers, documentarians, journalists, lawyers, everybody. What would you say in your 9-11 truth career was the most substantial moment in terms of waking somebody up to the truth? Well, I guess it had to have been Spike Lee because uh, uh, that was a, a deeply emotional experience on his part. Uh, when I was standing there for two hours, uh, I was sitting, uh, giving him the evidence one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he was in tears. Uh, wow. He was deeply moved. And, and so I knew that he was actually sincere uh, and, and that this was quite a tragedy. See, he wears his mask in the correct, uh, correct way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have you spoken to him since the falling out over the documentary? No, but I did send him some uh, additional evidence about um, the disease that's going around and uh, what's in the, uh, the cure uh, for that disease uh, that, that, that uh, is being so suppressed by the media. I don't mm. know if that's going to be helpful uh, for him or not, but um, I'm I, surprised I do by want his position to know as that... you've des described it, because he's such an activist for, uh, you know, 
black rights and mm -hmm. tries to educate people in terms of black history. And uh, it's just stating facts to speak about the Tuskegee experiments and various medical experiments that have been done on the black community. I know we don't want to take the conversation in that direction, and I don't want to get this video removed from YouTube, but it's a, it's a very curious situation that arose with him. I'm sorry you had to endure that. Thank well, you. It was one of the just, toughest moments in my life. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry, Richard. Uh, just add an external perspective. I, I was not involved in this uh, communication between Richard and Spike. Looking at it from the outside, it looks to me because what happened was they didn't just edit Richard out of the, you know, the piece. Uh, there were family members in that piece yeah. uh, who weren't saying anything about COVID. They were talking about 9-11. There were right. other scientists in the piece doing the same. Um, the piece could have could have been edited and still could be edited if they're just concerned about Richard and his his position on COVID. Uh, it could have been edited to, to make the point that was intended to be made that I think Spike probably grasped, as Richard points out, he probably grasped it. And so I think this decision probably wasn't Spike Lee's in terms of how this was handled. That's my guess. I think it was another example of this broader propaganda campaign to discredit anyone. In this case, it was going to COVID, but the purpose was though to squelch a 9-11 piece. Yeah. And I think it was tactically done it, it achieved the, you know, the propagandist objective of, again, squelching a 9-11 piece that was just help, talking about the evidence. And, you know, the, and, and that piece, you know, Spike still got the film. Somebody could still put that piece together even today. And if they, you know, if want to edit Richard out, they could do that. I'm not recommending they do that, but they could. And they could, <laughs> and they could still show the truth about yeah. it. So there, there's, there's more here than just Richard and COVID going on. Absolutely. And I think it's a generous and diplomatic explanation that you've offered. I would counter by saying it's my opinion that Spike Lee has reached a level in his career where he is an auteur who has the ability, particularly with HBO, to demand final cut. And I would not absolve him of culpability uh, as readily as you have, but I appreciate that sentiment. You know, the other thing that I found here from the Anti-Defamation League, which I really found reprehensible. They're talking about Richard and specifically this debacle with Spike Lee. And although the article does say that, you know, Richard uh, is a prominent, according to them, conspiracy theorist, which what does that even mean? Uh, it talks about him founding the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. They're generous in their description, saying that Richard doesn't have an history of explicit anti-Semitism, but we're still going to bash him anyway. This is absurd to me because what it's saying is simply because Richard has interviewed with other individuals that the ADL has an issue with, they're going to put him on this, you know, sort of most wanted internet hated conspiracy theory list and smear him in their own way, in their own propaganda campaign. I know you guys did a lot of very good work. Or I should say Richard's former group with the architects and engineers did a lot of work with the uh, University of Alaska in Fairbanks. We're almost out of time, gentlemen, but if, uh, if you want to take us out, uh, maybe each of you could get a final word. Yeah, I want to be sure that people understand that um, speaking, especially with the loss of the Spike Lee uh, film opportunity, it is absolutely imperative that the current film project, 9-11 Crime Scene to Courtroom, get made. Now we have been we we have a, a couple three four altogether major donors who have provided the seed money for this project, and I mean forty thousand dollars of seed money pledged. It's a matching grant, so we are beginning our fundraising drive now, so that everybody else at lower levels can pitch in and help us to achieve the hundred twenty thousand dollar budget. So that's only $80,000 left to go. So if everybody can make this happen by visiting uh, Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry website, which is LC for F-O-R 911 Inquiry. No, it isn't. Is it, Mac? It's LC for 911.org. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. LC for 911.org. 
Uh, and there's an opportunity there to donate tax deductible nonprofit organization, whatever amount you find yourself uh, comfortable uh, that, that, that's achievable for you, because every bit helps from $10 to $100 to $1,000 to $10,000. It's going to take all of us pitching in where we can just stretch a little bit and make this important documentary with this Emmy award-winning investigative journalist and filmmaker, Christina Borgeson, directing it. it it's, it's going to be very exciting, but it takes all of us, so please pitch in. Absolutely. Mick, any final words? Well, I think um, it's important to follow up on what Richard said. You know, we're probably not going to get this project done without your support, you, the viewer support, so really, uh, you know, it's not like we're a lawyer's group with a bunch of affluent lawyers. I'm a public interest lawyer. I'm typically uh, close to broke because I what money I do earn, and I have earned some money, I put back into good causes, which I'm doing in this case. So, uh, you know, we're, we're surviving, but we're not doing much more than that. We really, you know, you, you are the hopefully not silent partner in this project. We really do need you to see this through. So give what you can and we'll do what we can to make sure it happens. And I would close by saying there are there are three mysteries that impressed me about 9-11. Why did the buildings fall? Uh, why has the government done something about the evidence of demolition? And, and then who did who done it? The first mystery has been solved by the work of the scientists, architects, and engineers. We now know why the buildings fell down. It was explosive demolition. It's not a mystery anymore. That evidence is going to be explained in a user-friendly way by Richard and we're going to help them in the documentary we're producing. The second question, why hasn't the government done something about that demolition evidence, is the second part of the documentary, which is the government cover-up. And then the third part, the whodunit, we're going to get into at the end about what, you know, where does the evidence lead us and where do we need to, how do we need to follow that evidence to hold the folks accountable. So we hope you can support us in this adventure. Absolutely. And I want to reassure our audience that the uh, lavish looking office behind Mick <laughs> is virtual. That's a five cent JPEG. <laughs> so don't it confuse is. any of that with uh, any of the expense that your tax deductible donation to LCFOR911.org, the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. Your tax deductible contribution is going to help the Lawyers Committee to educate the world into the facts and details of what happened on 9-11. I want to thank my guests today. It's always a pleasure to have the Lawyers Committee and its members on the show. And I want to remind viewers that you can support this show by going to subscribestar.com slash crowdsource the truth or patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth. Gentlemen, we're going to have you back very soon. Good luck with the upcoming film project. And thank you both so much for joining me today. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great evening. Thank you, Jim.